Now, the sermon today goes right along with the Bible study series, AHA. This is the first sermon for the AHA series, and it complements, they complement one another. So, if you don't get totally full today, which you shouldn't, you should still leave hungry. Boy, you'll get a whole bunch Wednesday to go right along with it. AHA is defined as a sudden understanding or a sudden recognition, sudden resolution. And over the years, I've talked with folks, and I know you have too, and had people tell you that they've had an aha moment in their life where suddenly they realized God was talking to them about something. Amen? Um, I've discovered that aha happens when three elements come together. I discovered that during this Bible study, uh, and that's what Kyle lets us know. And uh, these three elements, you might want to write them down if you take notes. But the first one is a sudden awakening. A sudden awakening. The next one, number two, is brutal honesty. And the third one, third one is immediate action, which is where aha comes from. Awakening, honesty, and action. Aha. That's where you... Hey, how many of y'all... You, yeah, you're getting some north and south now. I'm still in the introduction. It's like, yep, God's done that to me. Uh, oh, wow, it was you all along. If you study many aha moments in Scripture, you'll discover that these three factors are in that collision every time. And the one that we're going to study is Luke chapter 15. And in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, is the parable of the prodigal son. And that's where we're going to spend the next few weeks on that one parable from Jesus about the prodigal son. You're probably familiar with the story. I, I doubt if anybody here in here is not. But even if you aren't familiar with it, you're going to find out that this Bible study series and this sermon series will teach us a lot about God, a lot about Jesus, a lot about ourselves, and a lot about the aha moments in our lives. Some of you all are probably sitting on an aha moment right now, and this is going to bring some life to what you're going through. My prayer is that by the end of this series, each and every one of us will have an aha story to tell. And that aha story will be a new beginning for us that we can share with one another, share with those that don't know Jesus. Our aha moments in our lives is sometimes the testimony that turns someone else around and gets them to come back into the house. Amen. But before we get there, we need to start at the beginning. We've got to start at the beginning. Every story has a beginning. It has to start somewhere. You have to have a, a once upon a time. Right? Once upon a time. So let me see if you can name the story. And feel free to shout it out. If you know this story by the beginning, I'm fixing to say. And I'll, I'm going to know some movie buffs in here. Here's the first one. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Okay, here's the next one. The Marleys were dead to begin with. Uh-oh. What? Christmas Carol. Timmy knew it. The last one. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Tale of Two Cities. This was the beginning of... But you knew the entire story by the beginning. The beginnings of the story are important. They set the stage. They tell about the life and what it was like before the story. The beginning of a story often says a lot about the end of the story too. Amen? Now, how can you have a rags to riches story if you don't know about the rags? You've got to have a beginning. And so let's go to the beginning. So if you read in Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to just read the first two verses. Like I said, we're going to be dissecting this for six weeks. But ch chapter 15, verse 11 and 12. And in 11, the beginning of this parable of the lost son, it says, Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of this state. So he divided his property between them. The story begins at home. This is powerful. The story begins at home. The father and his two sons together at home. They're living together. They're, they have their estate together at home. The father's obviously not poor or the son wouldn't be looking to have his portion of the estate. And if you read later into the story, he has livestock and servants. They have a good life. 
home is a good place to be. But there's something in the younger son that makes him want to leave. No matter how good it is. No matter how well he's provided for. He wants to leave. No matter how much his family loves him, he wants to leave. You know, when the son asked the father for his share of inheritance, it's as if he looked at his father and says, Dad, I wish you were dead. That wouldn't go over well even today. But back then in that culture, that was all by all rights, the son could have been put to death for his disrespect to his father. The son is obviously immoral, rude, crude, selfish. He treats his father with the utmost disrespect in that culture. Even today, that would be just unimaginable right? to treat your father that way. Living a good life and say, Dad, just give me my inheritance now. I want to leave. Dr. Kenneth Bailey lived and taught in the Middle East for many years, and he said that he only heard of this happening twice. In the very first case, the son was chased out of the house by his angry father. In the second case, although the man was previously very healthy, the father died within three months. And I would believe that he died from a broken heart. This request started off as something that came out of a little selfishness. He probably didn't intend to break his dad's heart. He didn't intend to hurt the family. He probably never wanted to destroy his relationship with the family. But what started as a little selfish ambition to make his own way without anyone looking over his shoulder, dad, the father, it ended up costing him more than he ever imagined. And it's easy to side with this story. It's easy when, when we're on this side of the story to look and say, what an idiot. What an idiot. He had it, he had it all. All he had to do was just keep living the life. He didn't go hungry. He ate the best of the foods. Had a servant. He had it made. What an idiot. It's easy to pretend that we've never done anything so foolish in our whole lives. But my guess is that if you'll be honest with yourself, really honest, you'd have to admit that you've left home too. Now, I don't mean you grew up and left the house. That's natural. You're supposed to. I'm talking about the spiritual application we all know. It's not just the physical father, but the Father, our Lord God, and the house that you're in right now. And the family that's surrounding you right now. And people leave for selfish reasons. And they don't understand. Many times, you know, after five years of being a, a pastor of a church, people leave and they come back after months and they're like, well, or like me, I've, people have been, man, I've been gone only three weeks and everybody's like, man, he's grown up so much. He's so much bigger. He hasn't gotten in trouble today yet either. Notice that. It's just amazing. Okay, hope I didn't jinx that. But anyway, when you're gone, things change. I've had people come back and go, well, so-and-so don't treat me the same way. I said, well, you left the family. I mean, you're back. I'm sure they didn't mean, they didn't intend to hurt your feelings. They didn't intend to, to treat you differently. But you're, you're different too. You, you left the family and now you've come back. For whatever reasons. What were those reasons? Ask yourself. What is it that makes us want to leave home? What is it that, wants to, that makes us want to leave home? Your family. Leave God. What is it that drives us to leave a good father who has always provided for us? I would imagine that the request started off as something a little bit like, um, I just want to do it myself. I just, I'm just not getting what I want. I'm just, I just don't feel like I'm getting what I need. But what started off as a little selfish ambition to make our own way without anyone looking over our shoulder and we know we'll be all right, ends up costing us more than we ever imagined. Some of our friendships never seem to be the same again. Amen. I got some people that's living it. They, 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 they turn. We know God cares for us, and we know God provides for us. We know God saved us from sin. We know home is good. Then why do we leave? There's something within us that makes us want to leave. 
something inside us that makes us want to leave, like a moth going towards a light. <laughs> 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 Sometimes, that wasn't in the notes, but I was going to write. Sometimes we can't resist the urge to ask for our inheritance and take it and go. But if we know home is good, why does anyone leave in the first place? Number one reason, I want it now. I want it now. Instant gratification. One of the reasons we leave the Father's house is because we want instant gratification. We're not good at waiting. Anybody here good at waiting? Because I need to know your secret. Amen. We're used to instant messaging. We're used to instant applications that work the minute, I mean, the second we get them downloaded. I mean, as soon as it downloads, it says open. It don't say go find it. It's ready. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Instant popcorn, instant soup, chicken noodle soup, dump it out of the can, two minutes, 45 seconds later, I'm ready to eat. Instant GPS. Where am I at? Push the button. Now I know where I'm at. We're used. We, but a lot of Christian life, a lot of our Christian life, a lot of the living in the Father's house is on delayed gratification. And we don't want that. Delayed gratification. See, we're saved. But we still live in a fallen world. So we wait. We have the sure hope of heaven. But we're not there yet. So we wait. We've been promised all the things will work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8.28. But it sure doesn't seem like it sometimes. So we wait. And after waiting for a while, it gets real easy. Real easy to get sick of it and just think, I want it now. I want it now. So we leave the Father's house looking for what we think we should have. I know I can get some witnesses here that have left the Father's house thinking you could get what you should already have and you still be looking. Because see, God's already given us. Our Father's already given us everything that we need. I didn't say one. But he's taking care of all our needs. But our mind's saying, but if only you ate from this tree... Hello. Second reason. I deserve it. I deserve it. It's called entitlement. We leave the Father's house because of this dangerous mentality that we think we deserve it. It's our entitlement. It's ours. This attitude of I deserve it is I've been faithful long enough. Uh-oh. Some of us have been there. Now, I deserve it. I've done my dues. I got my T-shirt. I have paid my dues. It's time that I huh, fill in the blank. I deserve it. I've been patient long enough. Now I deserve my fulfillment. I've done it God's way long enough. I want to do it my way for just a little while. Mm. Some of us. God's way is just not working fast enough for me. I deserve it. Have you ever felt that way? Something. Amen. Like a never-ending reel, and in and out, or back and forth. In and out of church. Back and forth. Wondering when you'll finally get the reward you deserve. What this mentality forgets is the one core aspect of Christian life. And it's grace. We're saved by grace. We don't deserve it. And anything short of hell is more than we deserve. And if we stay focused on that, we won't think about, I deserve it, and it's entitled to me. It's not about doing enough good things for a long enough time that we earn the right to leave the Father's house. And the final one, I can do it better on my own. And that's when we get bitter. That's when we're bitter. I can do it better on my own. The third common attitude that makes us leave the Father's house is an attitude of bitterness that says, I can do it better on my own. You really get this idea from the younger son in verse 12 when he says, just give me my inheritance and let me go. Whatever he was looking at, he wasn't going without 
but he just felt like he could do it better on his own. You get the sense that the son just wanted to do it on his own. He wanted to try his own hand at everything else. He wanted to be his own master. He wanted to be in charge. In some ways, this third attitude combines the first two, if you think about it. You want something now, and you think you've earned it. And I can do it better on my own. What this attitude forgets in the Christian life? Living life in the Father's house is all about being a slave, a true servant to God. See, the Apostle Paul uses that language frequently, and he says that he is a slave of Christ. A slave has resigned all rights. A slave has no claims to his own power. He's given up all his decision-making to God. We as slaves of righteousness have surrendered to God. And so many of us struggle with that on a daily basis because we want something to be done a different way or we want something to be done a certain way. And it's usually got something to do with the selfish my way. We don't get all the shots. We don't get to call all the shots. God does because he's the king. Amen. But here's one of the most fascinating things about our Lord. Just like the father in the story. He lets us make those statements and he lets us walk away. And when we walk away, we usually walk away feeling like we have a blessing. He walked away with a pocket full of money. And the Lord lets us turn and leave out and leave the house, leave the family, and walk away. And things seem to be going great, usually for a short period of time. And then they realize, we realize, I've realized before, wow, this ain't so great. The money dwindles down, and sometimes pride keeps us from ever coming back to the Father's house for a very long time. A very long time. It's not that God likes it when we make that choice, but he gives us the choice. It's not like he couldn't stop us, but he's a gentleman. So God allows us to choose him or to choose to leave him. And a lot of us at one time or another, or maybe right now you're even considering, and God has touched you in a mighty way today, have thought about one of those three statements and you're ready to just go try it on your own. It starts off as a little request, a little control, a little harmless pleasure, but not trying to tell God He has no life in you, no place in your life. You just want to try it this one time. I don't know if you can relate to this, but I bet everyone in here can if they think real hard about a time where you skipped church, you left the body, you, you, you went out on your own because of whatever it was, or anything from sporting event to visiting a zoo, whatever it was. A personal thing vacation and you let that become your God and you just don't want to go back because everything's good you left with a blessing you still feel good and eventually it dwells down you need to be fed again I know I need to be fed while I was gone Woo! you're not trying to tell God he's not number one in your life but you're thinking can't there be a close second you're not trying to tell God that he was wrong about your marriage but you're saying well can't I'd be a little happier. I know people that are over, more than one that's been married over 20 years and they're divorced now. And the number one thing that I'm told is I just wanted to be happy. I wanted to be happier. So God was wrong about that marriage. You're not trying to tell God that you want nothing to do with Him, but it's just silly to give money to the church when your friends are driving brand new luxury cars. I talked to an individual just while I was on vacation that's not been going for quite some time and it's because they can't pay their tithes you know some people won't go because they just feel like they can't pay their tithes but the reason they can't pay their tithes is because they bought something they shouldn't have bought God knows that already whether you come to his house or not <laughs> amen you may not intend to tell God he, you wished he was dead but that's exactly what you're saying when you leave amen so in closing now, that's, that's what we're doing. When he looked at his daddy in verse 12, he says, just give me my inheritance and let me go. But when we look at the father and we say, I'm tired of this. I'm just going to go do it on my own. I can watch some sermon on TV and not get out. 
I don't need to be around the family. I can get all I need there. You're just telling him you, you wished he was dead. You got your inheritance. You're good to go. So in closing, here's the truth. We've all left the Father's house at one time or another. Some may even consider it now. It's not so much a question of whether or not you've left. It's not so much a question or not or what the excuse you use to leave. It's much more a question of whether or not you'll come home. There's people that sit in the church and they're not in the church. There's people that sit in the church with a critical spirit looking for something wrong to see if the pastor said something wrong and they're done. Well, you should have found something wrong with my message within the first five to ten minutes, no doubt, that let you sit there and be critical the rest of the 20 minutes I talk, which means you leave unchanged you never was here to begin with and you've left the Father's house. Now's the time to come home. It's much more whether or not you'll come back. Will you come home? Nothing was lacking. Not really. Nothing was really missing. Everything was provided regardless of who's standing here, regardless of what kind of music we listen to. It was just where was your heart? It's time to come home. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, right now, I just thank you for this powerful message, Lord. I, I just ask right now, Lord, that each and every one of us is leaving changed. That we're, we're accepting this series and this study, Lord, that will, that will let us become more intimate with you and see the aha moments in our life, Lord. The aha moments and what it's all about. Lord, help us be better Christians, be better servants and slaves for you. Realize it's all about you and nothing else. And Lord, I pray each and every one of us knows your Son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord. And if not, Lord, you put it on our hearts to talk to a blood-bought saint today. Let them know that we need to be right with you. We ask for your travel mercies as we leave today, Lord. To get us where we got to go. For those that are not going down south, that you would just uh, put a, 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 a give them a, a, a movement in the Spirit to pray around 1 o'clock for a touch of the Holy Spirit down at days. We claim salvations. We claim, we claim lives being changed down there. Travel mercies for everybody where they're going. And Lord, bring us back again safely as a testimony to one another of what you're doing in our lives. And we give you the glory for that. In Jesus' mighty and most precious name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord.